Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Friday live stream. We've got a lot of things to go over, so let's just jump right in. So first of all, the, the thumbnail and title suggests there's some big news, and it's not the big news that Stripe is getting back into crypto and digital assets. It's who they actually picked to build the rails. So we're going to talk about this and a couple other stories, but this, I think, is, is the big one moving forward. And before we listen to one of the co-founders from Stripe talk about the different cryptos that they actually chose for these payment processing rails, I just want to start first by starting off by talking about why Stripe is a big deal. Because for most people, they're like, who cares? It's Stripe. It's just some payment processor. But I don't really think people realize how big they actually are. And because I use Stripe for all my websites, and they are essentially the major payment rails besides PayPal. And they're the ones that actually onboard Visa and MasterCard for the payments on e-commerce. And I said, this is on from uh, yesterday. This is huge. They're going to use Ethereum and Solana. No other chains for Stripe payments. Stripe is, uh, in the US alone, is on almost a little over 700,000 active websites or roughly over half of all the websites for e-commerce in America, they are on, 56% to be exact. Globally, they're used by 46 countries and 2.72 million websites. That's a lot of websites. And not only that, they're used by the major e-commerce stores that are out there. Walmart, I don't know if you have heard of that. Walmart's pretty big. Amazon, Apple, AliExpress, Google, Wafer, Samsung, and they all use it, all of them. So I said, it's interesting to note that the support for Bitcoin payments, because this isn't the first time they've delved into this. I think people talked about this, uh, something about last year, but around 2018, 2017, 2018, they actually allowed for Bitcoin payments to be on there and they shut it down in the early half of 2018 because either there was no demand or I think we all know that functionality uh, for Bitcoin, for Bitcoin payments was not happening, especially as the transaction fees went higher and the network got congested. I shudder to think what they would try to do right now with ruins and orbitals and all the things that are going on with the Bitcoin blockchain. So that I think is pretty big. And then as a reminder, or not as a reminder, just to talk about, Stripe, as far as payment volume goes, one trillion. One trillion dollars in payment volume in 2023. That's pretty big. And you can see that over time, I mean, going back to its when it first was found in 2015, correct me in the comment section, this is just the data that I have, uh, you can see that just how much it uh, grew exponentially and how big payments actually are across the world. So it's not just Stripe that has taken a look at these stable coins, failed billing USDC. This was a uh, website that was shared with me by Jean-Louis. And they are tracking stablecoin transactions as well because they don't want to be left behind. And I thought it was interesting because they have they have at a glance that the total transaction volume, and this is interesting, 2.5 trillion stablecoins in the last 30 days. Let me say that again. <laughs> 2.5 trillion of total transaction volume in 30 days for stablecoins, all stablecoins put together. How much did Stripe have? One trillion in the whole year, 30 days. But wait, there's data to take a look at. And data is a funny thing because like I could have just stopped there and everybody's like, ooh, this is fantastic. This is great because now, you know, we're stable coins are taking over the world. Data is a nuanced thing. And it's one of those things where you have to actually dig deep to get the actual information. And this is the number of transactions of 356 million. But there's this piece down here that talks about adjusted and unadjusted volume. What does this mean? Well, this is from, from Visa, usa.visa.com. This was just put out, what's the day, the 25th? Yesterday, the 26th today. It's interesting because like, if you take a look at this, stable coins are taking over the world. I mean, look at that, just going up and to the right. And it's, it's cutting into, uh, Visa transactions, ACH, and Fedwire. Of course, this is looking at yearly. But here's the, here's, the, here's the catch, and here's where data gets nuanced. And stablecoin has a lot of noise. Developers in all different parts of crypto space can create automated bot programs that perform activities such as stablecoin arbitrage, liquidity provision, and market making. 
on-chain transaction resulting from interactions with these automated programs don't resemble settlement in the traditional sense. So again, they can just make bots move things back and forth. People are like, woo, look at all those transactions, but they're false, they're funny money. It doesn't really happen. What does the data actually say? Well, this is why Visa, who does not wanna be left out of the game, they built this dashboard. In a nutshell, Visa on-chain analytics dashboard aims to address everything that's problem as far as like the, the stable coins. So looking at the data, we found three notable trends. Stable coin supply is approaching all-time highs. That's good. Steady growth of monthly active stable coin users. That only makes sense. I think people are, are giving up on fiat across the world as they see that, hey, this is uh, kind of a Ponzi and there is hyperinflation around the world. And there's and the big one here is discrepancy between total transfer volume versus bot adjusted transfer volume. And they state when we apply a simple heuristic that removes inorganic data, we see the transfer volume for the last 30 days can be adjusted from 2.65 trillion to 265 billion. Let that sink in. That's a lot of bot activity that's just messing up the system. So again, if you can't take a look back here, if you wanna hide the unadjusted volume, this is what you got. It's not that much, but if you think about it, 265 billion in one month, I mean, in four months, that would let me make sure that my math is right here. Check me in the comment section. That's over a trillion, right? So in four months, it's doing the same type of volume organically that Stripe is doing. And there's a reason why these payment processors and these titans of industry are following along with this because they want a piece of the pie. Visa, from their annual report, their payments volume is 12.3 trillion. And I bet you, if we look back and how far and how far it's come, I bet you they're slowing down even though they got 10 trillion in 2021, 11.6 in 2022, and 2023, 12.3 trillion. I wonder just how much they're actually slowing down and what stable coins are taking a piece of that. So that's the part as far as like why this is, you know, why Stripe is, uh, is a big deal. Now let's get into it. And I want you to listen to this video because I don't want to have any discrepancies because I know people are going to listen to this and be like, well, why wasn't my chain included? Because my chain is awesome. And it has all this utility and there's all these developers in the community, damn it, the community. It doesn't really come down to that. There's a reason why they chose these chains. And I'm not going to, I mean, we'll discuss it in a little bit, but just take a listen to the co-founder of Stripe as he talks about which ones those actually are. And uh, we'll go from there. So just take a listen, make sure I got this. So you can hear this crisply and away we go. Leak things. Um... This is uh, the Stripe checkout you know and love, and you know it's got all the cool functionality. Like again, a big one for us is localization, where it looks different. You know, you see here, um, uh, depending on where the customer is coming from, it'll give them that really nice high converting localized experience. But you know, what's this new functionality over here on the right? Uh, we can pay with crypto. So we'll tap pay here. We'll go to a confirmation screen. And so, did I actually? Ah, we're on Hypernion. The ghost of Christmas past. Um, so uh, this is our confirmation page. You know, we passed in the email address for the checkout. Here we're selecting what chain we want to pay with. We're going to pay with Solana. Uh, here we're selecting, you know, what uh, wallet we want to use. You know, we could use Coinbase wallet or MetaMask. I'm going to use Phantom for the purposes of this demo. So when I pay here, it's going to bring up some UI from Phantom, which is uh, the crypto wallet that we're using. So this is the Phantom UI here. This is not Stripe UI. And you see here we're confirming, uh, you know, we're going to pay with Solana. The network fee, very cheap, you know, as we discussed, um, a network fee is coming down $99. Now, again, you're probably used to a crypto transaction. You're expecting, uh, you know, me to bring out another guest here and, you know, we'll do an eight minute uh, conver conversation while we wait for the transaction to clear. But that is old crypto. Are uh, you ready for the new crypto world? You have to look very closely and not blink. You ready? Oh, that tap. <laughs> That's it. We're done. And That, that confirmation page was not like this has been entered in a queue, you know, we're going to now go do something. It has now been posted to the blockchain already. And so if I go into my phantom wallet here and go into the Explorer, you see here it sent at 9.58 uh, today. We can view on the Solana Explorer. Um, this is, uh, I think the Explorer just loading is on the blockchain. 
Here we go. This is so you can go to this URL yourself if you are eagle-eyed and see this is a real posted transaction to the Solana chain. Similarly, we can view it in the Stripe dashboard. So if we click in here to our 9.58 a.m. payments, you see here we've made a payment with crypto. And again, Stripe handles everything for you. You just got $98 into your bank account. Um, but that is crypto coming back to Stripe. Yeah, so very interesting. I mean, the, the thing is, and you saw it right there. I want to make this crystal clear. They chose two chains. Two chains. Uh, they chose Ethereum and they chose Solana. Now, there's been rumblings, and I actually saw this from the uh, founder of Polygon. They said that they were actually chosen uh, on top of Ethereum, but there was no mention of that in that video. Maybe that will come out later and uh, we'll verify that. But I don't want to say that, yes, they're there, even though it wasn't said in that clip. If someone has some data, well, that's great. But it would make sense to me that a side chain would be used for Ethereum. And that, when I was taking a look at that, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you just saw the same video that I saw. What do you think would have happened if he would have chose Ethereum for that transaction? Would it have been that fast? And then the next question I have is, if you would have chose Ethereum, would Polygon have shown up or would another layer two have shown up? And why aren't other layer twos actually involved in this? And there's been no mention of those besides Polygon from the founder of Polygon in this story. I don't know where that would come from, but it's a good thing that they actually chose <laughs> And this is not going to be, this is not going to go over well for people like Solana, but it's a good thing he actually chose Solana because it actually worked out. Now, having said all that, people are screaming at, they're, they're screaming at their screen right now going, but Solana is down all the time. 75% of transactions don't go through at the very peak. And I got you. You are 100% correct. That actually does happen. So when I take a look at this, this is the discussion we'll talk about in Q&A. Do you think that they're going to play like a squid game effect between Ethereum, whatever layer two has come on, or just Ethereum on the chain, versus Solana to see which one can actually hack it. And if they can't, boom, they boot them and they see what actually happens. And the next question is, is why, and this was actually, this actually came out, it was a good point from uh, Coinfira. Well, it was a point. I, some people say it's not a good point, but whatever. Coinfira says, I just don't get it. Why Solana, the VC money really speaks volumes, a chain that keeps breaking constantly, why? And I said like this, I go, because normies don't care. Normal people don't care. They want it faster, they want it cheaper and easier. And it's just the same thing across the board. So with Stripe, you have to understand that for me as a merchant, I'm gonna pay fees. I'm gonna pay 2.99% plus 30 cents per transaction. Now, there are different fees and different structures depending on the volume that you do. I'm not a big volume user, but it can be as low as like, I think it's 0.28% plus like 10 cents per transaction, it just depends. So merchants are gonna get their fees. There's going to have to be fees on there. And I wonder who's actually gonna pay those fees because if it's me, I'm not paying a layer one solution like Ethereum for the fees. That doesn't make any sense for me. Again, layer twos, maybe it is, maybe it gets rolled into it. But it's just interesting that those are the ones that they actually took. And there's a lot of questions and we'll, we'll follow up as these things gets rolled out. But let me know what you think about that in the comment section. I think this is a step in the right direction, uh, especially for just the optics and the eyeballs to say, hey, there's an option here to pay with crypto. I've never seen that again. 56% of the websites here in America. And of course, globally, you've got over 100, so, or 2.8 million. So let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And also, this is a pretty big story. The oldest bank in the United States, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but the oldest bank in the United States, BNY Mellon, on their financial statements, uh, they, it was revealed that they have been investing in the Bitcoin ETF. And not only just on the ETF, but they've been investing in uh, BlackRock and Grayscale together. So I know people will say, well, Grayscale is only there for output. Not so. I think for, in some situations, uh, people are actually buying into Grayscale for whatever reason. I think they actually lowered their rate. So that, again, is very bullish. I like to see that. But then there's been some stories that haven't been very bullish. And I want to dispel this right now because this is the beauty of being around for so long is that I see this same nonsense being regurgitated time and time again. Watcher Guru says, President Biden proposes a 44.6% capital gains tax, the highest in history. The proposal also includes a 
25% tax on unrealized gains for high net worth individuals. This would be in the bill itself, as far as like what would be considered high net worth individuals and 25% tax on unrealized gains. What that means is this, you bought Bitcoin at a dollar, today it's $60,000 or whatever it is today. You're gonna to get taxed without selling Bitcoin on unrealized gains, meaning you need to sell your Bitcoin and this, is, this would be in real estate, this would be in gold, this would be in whatever you do, unrealized tax gains. And here's what I said, this is stupid. This gets trotted out every single year. This is like the third year I've heard the same thing. And every year they shoot it down. If they do unrealized gains, and Janet Yellen got stumped on this, Secretary Treasury, because they, because they, she was asked, well, if you're gonna do unrealized gains and you gotta do unrealized losses as well, and guess what, I got a ton of those. So if you wanna play that game, we'll play that game, but it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And don't just take it from me. I mean, I've heard this song and dance for three years now. This will be the third, I think. Mark Cuban also said it. He goes, look, he didn't propose it. It's been in his proposed budget for years. It has no chance of passing. It was like Trump saying he would get rid of the ACA. Neither had a chance. Should he take it out? Absolutely. And I told people in the campaign to actually do that. That's this is the same thing of why I don't essentially saying I'm supporting Deaton for Senate, which I have to wholeheartedly agree with uh, Mark Cuban in this one over Senator Warren. Very nice. So again, breathe easy, everybody. It's not so bad. It's just essentially a bargaining chip for you can get the other the other elected officials to come across the table and go, look, if you're not going to go for this, why don't you go for this? And if you don't do this, then of course, this will be negative in the campaigns as we roll things out during this year. Anyhow, that's what we have for that piece. And then also another, I guess this is negative, but um, not so much. So this, just so everybody knows, uh, the SEC just gave a Wells notice to consensus. And consensus, of course, the foundation for Ethereum. And Eleanor Terrett, she put this out. I, I do like Eleanor. She's very. You should follow her on, on on Twitter. If you like cats, you're gonna love her. But she's a uh, Fox Business journalist, and and she's remembers a lot of things I forget. And she states here in 2019, this age like milk. In 2019, consensus founder uh, Joseph Lubin said that uh, the SEC and consensus are big friends. Explain the agency views both Bitcoin and Ether as decentralized and the no transaction involving these particular assets are a security. So this is about a minute or so. I just want you to, to listen to this. It's kind of funny if you think about it because here they are saying, these guys are great. And then of course they get sued years later, but that's just par for the course. Take a listen to this. We are big friends and fans of, uh, of that organization. I think they're, they're really understanding the space well. Uh, they are applying uh, this thing called securities law uh, to, uh, business, to business in America and other places uh, as they have done for, for many decades uh, successfully. They're identifying fraudulent projects. They're identifying obvious transgressions of securities law, um, but they, they haven't had a heavy um, touch really. Um, they've been gathering information, they've been taking some actions. They've been very clear that they're, they understand there is this new construct, uh, this uh, protocol-based open platform. So you think they get it? Uh, yeah, we believe they get it. Um, they've introduced a new construct, decentralization, into their thinking. Uh, so in addition to the Howey test, uh, they have this new construct uh, that they're seeing certain things in. So they consider the Bitcoin network uh, and token um, and issuance mechanisms. They consider the Ethereum network token and issuance mechanisms to be uh, decentralized and uh, therefore no transactions involving those particular assets are considered to be uh, transactions of securities. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I got to agree with Joe here. I think that uh, they were going in the right direction. And unfortunately, they got setbacks. That's just what happens. So what I wrote here was, and it wasn't very smart of me to say this, and I'm going to tell you why. And I said, ha ha, be careful with the boots you lick. Sometimes I'll just kick your teeth in, <laughs> which is funny to say it. But then I started to think, I'm like, hold on, 
And thankfully, Eleanor put the year down. This is in 2019. So Joe and Consensus the, and, the, and the Ethereum Foundation, they were not talking to Gary Gensler because he came in in April 2021 under Biden. He was actually talking to Jay Clayton under Trump because Jay Clayton was there from 2017, I, apparently until 2021. If I if, if this is correct over here at the sec.gov, I'm pretty sure it is. So when I said that Joe was probably, you know, like, hey, you know, we've got Jay Clayton. He understands exactly where we're at and this is good. He wasn't dealing with the nonsense that is Gary Gensler. So this comment that I said is not correct. It wasn't like Joe was licking boots. He was actually talking to somebody who kind of got it. So I'm just going to delete this comment because it's it's actually not a very nice thing to say. Maybe I'll make X a little bit better. Anyhow, let me just think about that in the comment section. And then uh, lastly, before we get out of here and do a little q and I'd like to do just a little, a new section to uh, Digital Asset News and for the, uh, the, the live, before we do uh, on these live streams and q and It's called, Should I Sell? Because... Correct me if I'm wrong, but everybody tells you to buy. Do they not? They tell you that this is the time to buy. This, this is the next project to buy. This is the dip you got to buy. You should buy. Have you been buying? You need to buy right now. Who talks about selling? Very few. And I need you to understand that it is tough to buy in the bear market. I get it. But what's going to be tougher is when things go parabolic and you need to sell. And I've been harping on this for, I don't know, 18 months or something like that. So what I want to do is get people in on the idea of, hey, at some point, you, you might want to sell, or maybe you never do. And then, of course, this will, you just turn this section off. So what I want to do is just go over some of the uh, different indicators. And we'll just do like one, just like one or two to take a look at as far as like, should I sell? And if you're looking for the videos of where I go over all the indicators and all the things, there's a link in the description. It's under crypto critical videos. There's two. When I'm selling, 80%. Another one that's called taking profits or the half and half method. So I just want to take a look at this. This is, ah, I get to steal Ben's stuff. So this is from the Cryptoverse because uh, we talk a lot about the time and risk bands. And there's ones that there, there's one that I was, I, was, I was telling Ben, I'm like, hey, Ben, do this for all the altcoins. He's like, I can't do it for all the altcoins because some are very new. It doesn't make any sense. So he said, if you're looking for like the time and risk bands, again, watch these videos here where I talk about that as far as what that is. But if we start to go above, I'll just make this very simple. If we start to go above like 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, as far as like risk levels, that's when things are getting out of hand and people and things are getting overheated. So like just today, the entire altcoin market cap, all of them, you're looking at 0 0.56. This is not a bad time to maybe buy, but not to sell. For me, this is not a good time to sell. And it's just taking a look at it. And I, what I like about this one is that over here, uh, well, no, that's not it. This one right here, sorry. There's another, another one I want to introduce. It's called the Bitcoin Cycle Master. And we'll talk about this in a bit, but look into bitcoin.com, 100% free website, check this out. And it, what I'll do is a whole nother video. But right now, if we're taking a look at the Cycle Master, it kind of, over. if you can overlay this, onto some of Ben's uh, color coded by risk, it matches up perfectly. So I'll do a video on that one, but I just wanted to show you just one thing that if we're taking a look at historical risk levels for the altcoin market cap, this is not a good time to sell. And then later on, as we do this, this little metric, I'll do it, take a look at MVRBZ scores, and we'll take a look at Fear and Greed Index, and we'll take a look at RSI stuff, and uh, we'll go from there. And lastly, lastly, I keep forgetting to, to do this, is I get a lot of questions on runes, which are essentially meme coins on Bitcoin. I know some people hate them, but some people are interested in them. So what I want to do is I want to do a video as to how and where to buy them and what to look out for. And uh, we'll do that not on this channel because that's not the channel for this. That'll be over on Dan DGen, which is more risky. But that's it for today. Mm. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. We're going to talk about is time sensitive.